Thanks for joining us for the message. We see this as the central part of our worship service. We'll have someone from our congregation read the passage and jump right into the text. Here's what John 14, 1 through 6 says. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This morning we are in John chapter 14. And John chapter 14, we had the reading of the scripture 1 through 6. John chapter 14, 1 through 6. You can see on the screen, this is a part of the I Am series today. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is one of seven I Am statements from Jesus that he used to identify himself as one that is not only equal with God, one who is God. Am I getting a little feedback? Is it okay? We'll get it, we'll get it worked out. I think I turned my other microphone off. <clears throat> this is the I am phrase that God used with Moses back in the burning bush when Moses was asked to co come help lead his people out of um, captivity in Egypt. Moses asked God this question in the burning bush, who should I say has sent me? And he said, tell them I am has sent you. And so Jesus is using the same exact phrase here in these seven I am statements. The Greek word is ego ami, and that is the same exact phrase that was used back in the burning bush to describe who God is, the self-existent one. So this morning we are going to look at one of those. If you've been with us during this series, you know that we looked at the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. And there's three more. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, and I am the true vine. And this morning we pick up in John chapter 14 with this I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is an incredible week that they are going through here. This is the Passover time of the year. On Monday, the Passover festival, remember Jesus came into town, and they celebrated him as the king. He was the king. And ever since then, the week has kind of gone like this for Jesus and his disciples. And so we get to this part, and this is a dinner that is part of the Passover week, and that is the Passover meal. All right, this is starting to get to me. Is it, is it, is it okay? I can go farther down. All right. You'll fix it. You guys will fix it. All right. So they get to the Passover meal. And the Passover meal, which is a huge celebration, is not going according to plan. Have you ever had a dinner party or a dinner plan that did not go according to plan? Have you ever had a bunch of people come over and some of you are nodding in your head? Yes, that you have all these plans and nothing. Maybe like 10 minutes before everyone shows up, you open up the oven and what was supposed to be done on time is not cooked hardly at all and you're like panicking. Or maybe you open up the oven and it's way overdone and now you've got to figure out what plan B of the meal is. Maybe you've had one of those dinner parties where one time, I remember for me, I opened up the oven to take the dish out that people had worked so hard for, and it's before everyone gets there, and I dumped it all on the floor, and it begs the question, if a dish falls on the floor and no one's there to see it, did it fall on the floor? <laughs> 
I think you already know the answer according to me. So you just put cheese on top, right? Even if there's no cheese in it, right? No recipe. You just put cheese, melt it over the top. No one will ever know. And then you hear these voices in the back. Someone's going to know. No one is going to know. No one is going to know. Or maybe you've been at one of those dinner plans and you've made all this preparations and it's all stressed and the family's yelling at one another. Maybe you're debating on who has to sit wherever and then the doorbell rings and they open the door, you open the door and you're like, hey, how are you doing? We're doing great. When like five minutes before, if they would have walked in, it wasn't so great. Or I've been at meals where everything was good, everything was sat, set, you sit down at the table and someone goes, I have an announcement to make. And everyone braces themselves and the announcement that's made, no one wants to eat after that. Some of those announcements you've been a part of, we're all moving to Nebraska or there are big plans in the family that you weren't aware of. Well, that's where we find ourselves with this Passover meal. As a matter of fact, if you read through chapter 13, which leads into chapter 14, let me give you a little picture where Jesus was with his disciples. In verse number one, it says in verse 33, before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. In verse number two of chapter 33, we see the devil was active. Now, when it was time for supper, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas to, to betray him. In verse number five, we learn that normally a servant would wash the feet for a big meal like this. But Jesus was washing the disciples feet. In verse number 21, we learn that Jesus was troubled in his spirit. It says, when Jesus had said this, he was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. In Luke's account of this Passover meal, we find out that there was a dispute that rose among them about who would be the greatest. And if you know anything about Jewish meals, where you sit at the dinner is a significant thing because it shows what importance you are in the group. And here the disciples are talking about the kingdom of God, which one of them would have the primary place in the kingdom of God. And so they're arguing about that. And then in verse 33, we get to the climax of it. Jesus says, little children, I am with you just a little while longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. They're devastated by this news that Jesus is going to leave them. And Peter speaks up here and says, well, why can't I follow with you? I am willing to lay down my life for you. To which Jesus replies, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So someone is going to betray him, Jesus announced. Peter is going to deny him. They're arguing about their place at the table. And Jesus says, I'm going to leave. So that gives you a little context why in John 14, verse number one, it starts with, don't let your hearts be troubled. And, you know, this often happens to us. We read them in chapters, but this is one story. And right after that, Jesus says, but don't worry, don't let your heart be troubled. Where do you turn when your heart is troubled? The disciples were having a lot of internal turmoil. Everything that they thought was that was going to be supposed to happen this week is fading away and vanishing. And Jesus says, I am leaving. He says, one of you is going to betray me and one of you is going to deny me. But Jesus gives them comfort. He says, it's going to be okay. And his answer in that first verse 
is kind of the theme of the passage, and that is believe in me. He says, you believe in God. That's kind of an indicative statement. You believe in the God you cannot see. So he says this imperative statement. So believe also in me, the one you can see. So the God that you do believe in, that's all-knowing, that's all-wise, that's all-ruling, that's all-caring, all-sufficient, has all resources, you believe in that God, you can also believe in me. And he ends it in verse number six with this statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's what I would like to look at this morning. Break down that statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and how he explains himself in this passage in that one verse. So let's dig into that statement this morning. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this would be a comfort to these guys when all seems to be lost. And when all seems to be lost, where do you turn? And how is this statement from Jesus one of the greatest comforts you will ever have? And I would say this, wherever this morning you are on your faith journey, God has a plan for your life, regardless of your doubts, regardless of your questions. If you come honestly before God and you ask him to reveal himself to you, I think you will find that God will show up. He will enlighten your minds and he will encourage your heart this morning. So if you did have the bulletin, you'll see that there are three points they're not really creative because they're right in the passage, the way, the truth, and life. But I put a little blank behind each of them because the first one we're going to see is I am the way. The way to what? I am the way to God. Verse number two says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you myself, so that where I am, you may be also. Here is what the disciples are going to learn. They're going to learn that this place on earth is not their perfect home. You've heard the phrase, there is no place like home. A year ago, some friends and us went on vacation together. <clears throat> And we went down to Mexico for vacation. And we learned something on this vacation. They invited us to a place that they um, go regularly, and it's all-inclusive. And what we learned, there are two types of all-inclusive when you go somewhere. There's the all-inclusive where they have everything you need. So like, you need a place to sleep, you need three meals a day, you need some activities to do, that's all inclusive. Then there's the all inclusive that they invited us to, and that's everything you want. That is a much more fun vacation because the first thing you meet is someone that helps you get all your meals lined up during the week, someone that gets all your activities, and then they introduce you to a guy, and this guy is your personal butler for the week. Have you ever had a personal butler for the week? I'll tell you this, when we got home, we realized we are the personal butlers when you get home. You know, when like the guy says, what would you like for breakfast at home? That's you that gets what everyone wants for breakfast. But this guy said, every morning we're gonna, what do you want to drink? We're going to set out fruits and snacks, and it'll be there every morning. It'll just be ready for you out in your kitchen area. And we're like, that's awesome. And then he goes, and so what would you like for breakfast? That's not breakfast. That's like first breakfast, like your coffee, your tea, all of that. And so he lines up everything. And anytime you want something, you go to the pool, you want a drink. Some of you have experienced this kind of. But there is a point during that. And it's usually about day five, six, or seven. There is a little longing in your heart for home because there is no place like home. And even though you kind of have everything you want here, you realize it's not really home. It's not the place of comfort, the place of rest, the place of familiarity, the place with relationships that you've come to be comfortable with. Often the reason 
our heart is troubled, the reason that we feel anxiety is because we were created for a home that is more than this. C.S. Lewis said it this way, I love this quote, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Because you see, back in the beginning, it was a perfect world. It was perfect human beings. It was perfect relationships. The surroundings around us were perfect, and that was the way that God designed it. When sin came in and things became broken, there became this vacuum, this vacuum, an empty place inside of us that needs to be filled, and it is relationship with the God. And what we typically tend to do is we fill it with other stuff, like if I get more money, if I get a bigger home, if I just only had different parents, or if I lived in a different location, or if I had a different type of home, maybe that would fill that void. But more of the same stuff is not going to satisfy. Jesus said it this way, I'm going away to prepare something for you that will satisfy all your longings. But verse number four is one of my favorite parts. He says, you know the way. Thomas speaks up. Now, poor Thomas. He's only mentioned three times in the Bible, and he gets a nickname for those three times that he's mentioned in the Bible. You probably have heard the phrase, Doubting Thomas. I think he gets a bum rap, because I think Thomas just speaks what most of us usually are thinking. He represents you and I. Jesus gives this great speech about, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and you know the way. And Thomas goes, um, no, actually, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know the way. I can hear in Thomas's voice, like, we don't know what you're talking about because you're always talking in riddles and parables. And every time we ask you a question, you answer us with a question. But Thomas is a lot like us because God works with people that have doubts and questions. And Jesus answers him this way, I am the way. The way is standing right in front of you. What does it mean when he says, I am the way? All religions must answer Thomas's question. We don't know the way. What is the way? So here is the theology this morning that sets our minds straight and makes our hearts settled. It's this. Jesus says, I am the way to God. I am the way to heaven. You see, God did not come into this world for behavior modification. Sin doesn't just make you bad. It's worse than that. Sin makes you dead. And have you ever noticed there aren't different levels of dead? Like, have you ever been to the hospital and they ask you your pain level and they have these smiley faces and frowny faces and it's zero to 10? And I'm always at nine, you know, just like what, just give me whatever you got. But there isn't one of those charts for the doctor comes in and says he's dead. Well, how dead? Well, he's like a six dead, right? There's not like, there's not one of those charts because You're either dead or you're not dead, and that is the problem with sin. Jesus came in the world not for behavior modification. It was to make you alive. He came to provide a way from death to life. And so when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, what he's saying is you can't come unless I prepare the way. That's what he means by I am the way. What has to be Prepared. A way needs to be made. Sin needs to be paid for. The wrath of God needs to be satisfied. Death needs to be defeated. None of that has been done, and you can't go there until I prepare the place for you. I'm going to break those bars. I am to go to become the way, and without that, there is no way. And I'm going to remove 
every single obstacle. When I was growing up, the version in the Bible that we learned was uh, that he's going to prepare a mansion for us. And as Americans, I think we read that and we're like, God's going up there to like build a house for me based on how I've lived in my life. And it's going to be on a hill. It's going to have 40 acres. And that's what it's going to be like. That's not what he's talking about here. He says, I'm going to prepare the way. He's going to be the way. He's going to become the way. Galatians 2.16 talks about what does it mean that he is the way. Paul argues this, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So the way is by faith alone through Christ alone. Now, one of the things that you might be thinking this morning is, isn't that narrow-minded that there is only one way? And I think this is one of the common themes that you will hear about Christianity that it feels very narrow that there's only one way. Here's another way to think about that. Think about if tomorrow there was a cure for all cancers. Someone came up with a cure, and it was a pill that could cure all cancers. I mean, it would be just a great celebratory day in the world. I think we would all have a few questions. Is there any side effects? What does this cost? But assuming that this is a free treatment, assuming that it was no side effects and the only effect is whether you have lymphoma cancer or bone cancer or liver cancer, all of it treated with this one pill. Do you think your argument to be, would be, that sounds very narrow, that there's only one treatment? Like, can you give me multiple options? Another way to think about it is if you're in a burning building and the building is burning and coming down around you and says, someone says, I found a way out. The door through there leads out. Do you think you would spend time arguing about that sounds very narrow that you are only giving us one option to get out of this building? See, when you come to the conclusion that God provided a way when there was no way. What happens is you have a heart of thanksgiving that God made a way. You become thankful because the way he describes is for everyone. Whether you are rich or poor, whether you're elite or you're common, whether you're good or you're bad, the way is offered for everyone. You become thankful that it is free. There is nothing you have to do. It is a gift that you receive. You're thankful that there is no limit in my father's house. There is many rooms. There is no limit to the number of people that cannot come. I find that there are often two reasons why someone might think this is narrow or that might be bigoted to think that there is only one way to God. And I think the first is they don't understand their desperate condition. They don't understand that they need God. And secondly, I think that often we don't understand the mercy of God. In Ephesians 2, it says, but God is so rich in mercy and he has loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. We have this great need, and God has offered it in his mercy when we didn't even want it. And we get, when we get this, that God has provided a clear, definite, totally attainable way, our hearts turn to gratitude. So first, he says, I am the way. Secondly, he says, I am the truth. The truth about what? I am the truth about God. A couple weeks ago, Matt spent a little time on this. We live in a society where it can be hard to know the truth. 
Have you heard someone say, I'm pretty sure, and it followed by something they speak that they had no expertise on or no knowledge in that subject, but they're like, I'm pretty sure this is the answer. And after you hear them, you're like, you, you have no knowledge about this at all, do you? We live in a society where there's a lot of subjective truth. But there's times when you want to know the truth. This last week, I said we went to Maui. One of the experiences that we enjoyed in Maui was the road to Hana. If you've been to Maui, maybe you've done this trip before. If you've not, maybe you've heard about it. Hana is a small town with like hardly any people, but the road to it is quite the experience. It is very curvy. There are many spots on the road to Hana where only one car can fit through, so you have to pull over to get there. The locals are driving this at like 50 miles an hour. You're driving at 10 miles an hour so that you don't fall over the edge of a cliff. There are waterfalls along the way. There are caves along the way. It's a pretty neat experience. <clears throat> but one of the things that we did is we downloaded an app. And this app is GPS-led, and it takes you along the way. and tells you where you should stop. It tells you you're going to see people standing over here. Don't worry about that. It's not really that important. Continue on the path. Um, but one of the things I really loved about the app was at the beginning, it gave a little history of the road to Hana. But then it said, let me tell you some things that you're going to want to know about this road. And one of the things you want to know is how to be safe. Like, how am I supposed to traverse this road so I come home safe? That's really important. One of the things I wanted to know, what are the important things to stop at and what are the things that I don't really need to? I don't want to get there and back and get home and someone's like, did you stop by the 100-foot waterfall? And I'm like, there was a 100-foot waterfall, right? I didn't want to do that, right? It gives you some hints about how to get along with your family along the way. And one of the ways you do that is if you're the driver, don't be a crazy guy, right? It tells you you might want to take Dramamine before you go if you're a person that is susceptible to that. But if you're going to, we left at 7 a.m. It's a town 50 miles and we got home at 8 p.m. So it's, it's a long day trip. It was totally worth it. It was wonderful. But to have a guide along the way giving you the things you needed to know was important. That's typically how we think of when you say something's the truth. And that is true about God. He is the truth. Truth comes from God. What God speaks is the truth. But this is a little different. <clears throat> I had a friend growing in, high, in college that would use this phrase, and it became a popular phrase. He wasn't the one that originated it, but he would say, that is the truth. As a matter of fact, there was a basketball player for the Celtics, Paul Pierce. His nickname was The Truth. I think Shaquille O'Neal gave that to him. And what it means is that's the real deal. That's the real thing. When Jesus says here, I am the truth about God, what he's saying is I am the real thing. I am God. Have you ever wondered what God is like? Jesus is the visual aid of what God is like. He is the truth about God. And why is this important? This is important because how you view God will impact how you view yourself. And how you view yourself will impact how you live your life. If you have the wrong view of God, let's say you view God like a police officer that's just giving people tickets all the time and pulling them over and finding all the things wrong in their life, you will tiptoe around in life when you think about God. If you think God is a tyrannical judge only, you will live in fear. If you think God is just your Powell, you will not take sin seriously because God's just a friend that doesn't really care how I live my life. If you are just a deist and you think God just started everything and he doesn't care about anything that happens after this, there will be no God to have relationship with. But the scripture is full of what God is actually like. 
And the gospel writers here, that is one of their goals, is to show you what God is really like because Jesus is God. You can see on the screen, it's from verse 6 and 7. And his argument is here that not only, like, I am the way, I am the truth, but he says, if you know me, you also know my father, because I am the truth about God. And the scripture is full of stories. So if you think God is out to get you, what do you do with stories about the lady who was caught in adultery? Or what do you do with stories, the woman at the well? Because here's what the Pharisees thought. This is what God's like. So they bring a woman in adultery, put him in front of Jesus, and like, let's see if he is God. Because if he is, he's going to stone her. And God says, Jesus, right in front of them, God says, which of you, without sin, why don't you cast the first stone? God was a person of mercy. Or the woman at the well at a place that he was not supposed to be at at that time of day, in a city that he's not supposed to be at, speaking to someone he's not supposed to speak to, they were like, this is not how God operates because that was not their view of God. What do you do with Matthew, the tax collector? What do you do with Jesus reaching out to the sick, the outcast, the prostitutes? Or if you don't think God is a personal God, you read stories about the lady that is going ready to bury her son in a funeral, and it says, the scripture says, Jesus saw her. He had compassion on her. He says, do not cry. Get up. There is no funeral Today, your son is healed. Don't compartmentalize God. He says, I am the truth about God. Jesus is the way because Jesus is the truth. I love Colossians 1.15. It explains it like this. The son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That is what Jesus is like. If you look down in verse number 8 in chapter 14, you'll see Philip speaks up, Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, and you do not know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. And later on in verse 11, he's like, Even if you don't believe that, at least believe my works. Like, who else have you seen speak to the weather and it changed. Who else have you seen hold the hands of someone that is dead and bring them back to life? And then he goes on to explain how the only standard is righteousness and I am the righteousness that gets you home. I am the truth. So last, in closing, let's look at the life. I am the way to God. I am the truth about God. I am the life with God. He said in verse 3 that I'm going away to prepare a place for you and I will come again to bring you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Jesus was not bringing political or social deliverance. He was bringing physical and spiritual deliverance. And why is that important? That's important because if the goal was only that when you get saved, the next thing is heaven, then we would all get saved and get out of here. And that would actually be freaky, right? If you came forward during a service and got saved, and like, I got saved, and like, oh, where did Paul go? He just went home to Jesus. That would be, there might be a few less people that just come forward after that. But there's two ways to think about this. It's the here now and the eternal. The here now and the eternal. Think about this. If you don't believe in the righteousness of God, you either believe that I'm not that bad, I'm okay, or I can earn my own righteousness. And here is what happens 
When you are always trying to earn your own righteousness, you become a slave to projecting that you are all put together. Have you ever had that in life? Nothing in life will suck the life out of you more than to be pretending to be something that you are not. Like, I'm all good. And so what we do to project the I'm all good, we earn money. We try to get successful jobs. We try to become successful people so that we can project that I'm all good. But you know what is so freeing? And what is so freeing about the truth, which is the righteousness of God, you get to embrace your failures and your shortcomings because this is not your standard of true life. Like, I know that we all like to be liked. I like to be liked. I tell jokes sometimes because I like to be liked. They actually work against me most of the time. But real freedom comes when you're not depending on projecting who you are or hiding the real you. Real freedom comes when you depend on a righteousness that is not your own. It is the righteousness with God, and that is true life. As a matter of fact, the psalmist says it like this, and this is my paraphrase. The fear of the Lord, those people sleep well at night. The opposite, David wrote it this way. When I kept my sins to myself, my bones wasted away. If you want to live a life where you have to earn your own way, it is going to take a toll on you. See, all the commands in the Bible, the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, they are leading you into the deepest life possible. One of my favorite verses in Psalm comes from Psalm 16, where it says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. The law leads us into a safe place. God is not trying to take anything away from you. He's trying to lead you into life. And if you're a parent, you know this. You want to see your kids thriving. I can't stand correcting kids. I would rather them just be perfect. I remember, so Olivia is 20. My daughter Olivia is 20. But back when she was two or three, one of her favorite things in life was ice cream. As a matter of fact, that hasn't changed. One of her favorite things in life is ice cream. But when she was little, we would give her this ice cream cone and it was usually summer. She was born in Minnesota, so it was hot and humid. And before she could get hardly any of it eaten, it would start to melt all down the side. You, you've seen this with kids, right? I mean, it's all coming down here. She's eating, it's all over here, it's all over here. So being a good parent that knows this is going to be miserable for her, what I would do is I would take the cone to help clean it up for her so she could have this fresh new cone. But here's a two and a three-year-old. Someone's trying to take your ice cream cone. So what do you do when someone is taking your ice cream cone? You grip the cone harder. As a matter of fact, you make holes in the cone where your fingers go in, no one's taking my ice cream. And as I'm prying her fingers away, a dad that's trying to lovingly help her, tears are coming down her eyes. Who is this mean person taking my ice cream? And how do you clean up ice cream as a parent? Well, you lick it all around. And I can see her eyes. Not only are you stealing my ice cream, you're eating it right in front of me. You're a horrible person. And usually there was this noise that came from her that shared how she felt about that. But when it was all done, I gave her this wonderful, beautiful ice cream cone back. And she was then happy again. The, the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots in the Bible, I think a great way to read those is a path to life. God is saying, path to life, path to life, path to life. Because who knows better about money 
sex, relationships than God himself. And he says this, no one comes to the Father but by me because what he's saying is most of the world's religions are really just moralistic deism. If you do enough of these things, you'll be good enough and you might be good enough where God accepts you. But you know, here's the problem with that. The problem is we're terrible at being good. Remember the Pharisees? That was Jesus, one of his biggest frustrations is they perceived to be this type of people. But Jesus not only knew their hearts, he knew their activities when no one was looking. And he said, you're like people that paint tombs to make them look nice, but inside you're dead. And there's usually two ways we try to fix that. We either hide it from people or we redefine what is good and bad. So where moralistic deism fails by just, I'm going to try to be good enough, grace says you have a righteousness that is not your own that you can depend on. And so I would sum it up this way as we complete the life with God. This is an invitation. It's not a judgment that Jesus is making. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to the Father through me. It's not a judgment statement. <clears throat> it's an invitation, an invitation home versus I'm trying to do it myself. Because more of what is not already making you content, getting more of that is not going to make you a content person. So without the way, where are you going? Without the truth, how do you even know to get there? And without the life, is it even worth it? So I said it's kind of the, the now and then the eternal. Because Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come again and take you to myself that you may be with me there also. This takes the focus off of a place and a focus on a person. I mentioned before, it's not about mansions. He says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. What he's saying here is the essence of heaven is the presence of Jesus. Listen, heaven will be great and it'll be on our imaginations. But the psalmist described it this way, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. And the reason is because where he is, that is where the life is. And in his place of dwelling, there are many rooms in his house. There's a room for you, and there is no limit to the number of rooms in his house. Heaven is the place where Jesus is and the place where he receives his family to himself. So we started with this phrase, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be be troubled. You can believe God because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. I am the way to God. You can know the way to God because I am the truth about God. Not what you think about God, maybe not what you've heard about God. Jesus is the truth about God and we see God in the face of Jesus. I am the real life. I am the best life.